and pass it over to you, Johnny, to lead the okay. session. Great. Welcome, everybody. It's sort of a gloomy day here in Manhattan. I'm looking out at a very rainy day. Oh. Um, kind of damp as well. Oh, it's going to be freezing rain when I'm on the road later. So. Uh oh. Uh oh. <laughs> so uh, I hope everyone's having a good time with the with this last chapter with Bateson, Gregory, um, and also are we looking at Nora? I've been paying a lot of attention to Nora. She had a wonderful interview on YouTube talking about liminal leadership. And um, she had huge questions about what leadership could possibly mean in the Anthropocene. Um, as do many of us. I believe this is a, a big challenge as we look at the conflicts that were mentioned last time, uh, Catalonia and Spain, and I think Jeffrey, you mentioned um, Quebec. Um, I mentioned the US Congress. So I think we see, and we also, uh, I, I focus my attention on the, the New York Times report as well on um, the last three years, one fifth of the coral reef has died. And um, trying to make meaning, uh, Nora says, is maybe not the best idea. We need to make sense before we can make any meaning. I thought that was a big challenge. Um, so anyway, I wanted to start off with a few um, quotations from this uh, chapter and from, from Gregory and from Nora, and a, a, free, a few reflections on the muddle that I find myself in, occasional order, lots of muddle, and, um, and uh, you know, ask about your process as you read this, what do you know now that you did not know when you started this project? Maybe something is coming up for you that might be useful and delightful for the group to uh, discover along with you. So here we are. I think this is uh, the second chapter after the metalogue. Experiments and thinking about observed ethnological material. I just want to quote uh, uh, right at the end of this chapter. He's looked at his own um, fuzzy kind of logic he applies in the context of his work as an anthropologist and uh, studying a, a different culture and how perplexing it is. And he says, so far I have spoken of my own personal experiences with strict and loose thinking, but I think actually the story which I have narrated is typical of the whole fluctuating business of the advance of science. In my case, which is a small one and comparatively insignificant in the whole advance of science, we can see both elements of the alternating process. First, the loose thinking and the building up of structure on unsound foundations. And then the correction to stricter thinking and the substitution of a new underpinning of beneath the already constructed mass. And then it goes on to say, and if you ask me for a recipe for speeding up this process, I would say first, we ought to accept and enjoy this dual nature of scientific thought and be willing to value the way in which the two processes work together to give us advances in understanding of the world. We ought not to frown too much on either process or at least to frown equally on either process when it is unsupplemented by the other. There is, I think, a delay in science when we start to specialize for too long, either in strict or in loose thinking. And this reminded me a great deal of uh, McGilchrist's book, The Master and the Emissary. I don't know if you guys know it, but it's a pretty popular book on um, the right brain, left brain dilemmas. And uh, Emma, uh, McGilchrist is saying that the right brain is the master, but the left brain and the left brain is the emissary. But unfortunately, the, the, in our age at least, the, uh, the left brain has assumed mastery. And that, uh, I believe, uh, McGilchrist thinks is a, will lead us to disaster. Every age, he says, it's oscillated back and forth. Um, you know, but because it seems like the left and right hemispheres tend to inhibit and constrain one another. Um, so 
I think this is uh, the this kind of research is a little uh, at, bit after Bateson when he was at his prime, and I think before he uh, and I think, but in this writing, I think I hear echoes of the future research on the the left and right hemispheres. Some of which has become very cliche, but some of it I think is still very very potent. Um, and I also want to something Nora says, because I'm interested in what's happening between father and daughter. And uh, in this, uh, this bit that we were assigned, mental monocropping, um, I'm just gonna read a little bit in the middle section of it. This culture, this language and culture favors singular focus, clear definitions and linear narratives of causation. A plus B equals C. If you do not have enough data on A and B, then you should seek the authority of the experts at either A-ness or B-ness. But the world is not made that way. Ideas live into the architecture of culture. They take up residence and make a home. Then they stain the carpets of our minds with spilt drinks. And then one decides to, pro to, pro to protect itself from outsiders and puts locks on the doors. Ideas are not tidy guests. On a personal level, you and I together are much, much more than one plus one. We are as many as we are able to be, and less and more. A single conversation between a married couple is evidence of enough of the shortcomings of logic. Who speaks truth? And she also has a, a wonderful uh, poem later in the book on the liminal. And I'm just going to read the first uh, stanza. If you lie to me, my skin will know. I won't notice, but the undercurrents will rearrange. Um, so, with all of that, I find myself um, once again in a, in a dilemma, in a, in a pleasant dilemma though, because there's, on one hand, there's all of this, which is very interesting. On the other hand, there's all of this, which is also very interesting. So I'm, I'm trying to figure out, well, what's most interesting and to pay attention to that. Um, I think, um, uh, a Phoenix wasn't, isn't here, but maybe he'll join us later, but he mentioned improv theater. And Ryan mentioned telepresence and the loose local effects. I'm talking about our last session. Um, Doug talked about the muddle quite a bit. Um, Lucy mentioned, I don't know if it was last time or the, or the first time we met, um, sensory deprivation and the effects of sensory deprivation. And, luminosity, uh, not luminosity, liminality, although I think there is a relationship between liminality and luminosity. Um, limit, liminality, limit, threshold, um, the transitional phase of a rite of passage, the hidden, the weird, the unsayable, relating to a sensory threshold in between life and death. So I'm reminded, and I'm sure we've all been in liminal spaces before, where we didn't know what to do, uh, where we couldn't quite make sense, much less any meaning of the situation. Um, I'm reminded of a very weird experience that I had. Um, I had, um, it was a dream state. It was a lucid dream. I was aware that I was dreaming. I was walking across a parking lot, a barren parking lot at night, and I saw a bridge, and I was moving towards the bridge, and there appeared what was seemed obvious to me was an angel. It was a very beautiful young man. Of course, I'm gay, so that would be an angel in my universe at any rate. And my impulse was to kneel in reverence. And as I did that, the angel said, rise. So I did. He pointed his finger right between my eyes and there was a bolt of light. And he said, and it went right into my third eye, from his finger to my third eye. 
or what I'm calling third eye. And he said, give up form. And everything, I fell into this black void. And, and in the black void, this is the blackest of black voids. <laughs> it was total, no, there was this total sensory deprivation. Nothing was there. <clears throat> and I heard, uh, uh, and this was territory I'd never been in before, even though I've had years of meditation. Nothing quite like this. And I heard a voice, and the voice came from above. Actually, there were several voices, but they were speaking different languages. But the voice that came from above communicated in English. It was a male voice, but I did not, I did not recognize it as my own interior voice, but a voice from outside of wherever I was. And that it had a location, gave me an orientation in a space. There was, no, because I heard a voice, there was an up, there was a down, there was a left, there was a right. Um, and the voice told me that what was going to happen was related to a life where I was a priest. And I got the strong feeling that it was a very unhealthy person um, that uh, actually a very conservative and perhaps persecuting kind of fellow. And I got this uh, empathically. I don't have any details, <clears throat> but I just got this strong vibe. And I woke up in my physical body, went on around my business. And, um, and then very shortly after that, everything in my life fell apart. Um, job, money, relationships. It was right at the beginning of the, the last recession. And uh, I remembered that if, and if I had not had that experience in the liminal zone, I am pretty sure I would have gone mad. So it gave me a sense of sanity in a very weird uh, set of circumstances in my personal life. And it was collectively a meltdown, as many of you may recall. Um, the, uh, the whole foundation of our economic system was, was wobbling very, very dramatically. So I'm just bringing all of this up because uh, how do we respond to these liminal zones? How do we make sense of them? And how do we make meaning from them? And that I think is the big challenge. I'm reminded of um, that those great lines by Shakespeare, life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that frets and struts his hour upon stage and then is heard no more. Tis a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That is as blunt as you can get. Of course, that's not Shakespeare, that's Macbeth, that Shakespeare's voice is coming through. So we're talking about a, 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 a nihilist, uh, a bloody tyrant. But I have, to, I have a feeling that this nihilism um, is actually runs very deep in our culture. And I think this is what uh, um, Nora is very persuasively uh, communicating in this interview and in the article that uh, Doug, uh, I think you posted that article on liminal leadership. The, 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 and then there are the passive forms of nihilism and then there are active forms such as drill baby, drill baby drill, like you hear the Republicans chanting and the oil companies. And then I think there's the passive forms of it, the couch potato forms of nihilism. Um, so I'm just throwing this out there, hoping it is, uh, stimulates uh, uh, something for our group. And I have, some, uh, I have a process that I'd like to share with you guys later in the conversation, if it's appropriate, um, about sense making. And this is uh, based upon my observing Nora Bateson's work with a group, and I was looking for patterns, and I thought she, she is a very sensitive to patterns, and she was, uh, I think, displayed some expertise, and I wanted to, and I sort of extracted from that a, a process that I think might be something experiential, uh, an exercise, I think would be very, a short exercise that could illustrate some of what she's talking about when she's talking about sense-making. 
which is different from um, making meaning, but there's a relationship. So I'm really interested in uh, what your experience of reading these texts has been this last week. If there's something you know now you didn't know before, I'd be delighted. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Johnny. That was beautiful. Um, um, I had some notes that I made. Well, I, I thought it was a challenging chapter, as all Bateson's chapters are. <laughs> um, it, it starts off again, feeling you know, all feeling lovey-dovey. Um, oh, there's this way of thinking, and it's got a double process to it. I mean, you first read these line, these part of the chapter, you think, oh yeah, he's kind of talking about science thinking anyway, which always has this sort of rigorous component and this loose component. But as you're reading it, you're thinking, I got a sense he's maybe talking about something a little bit different from just ordinary science. And then he, and then he gets into this whammy bit where he then lays out the example of comparing the segmentation in a jellyfish and a crab to the way the, the, the atmal society is organized. And you go, okay, so he's not talking about <laughs> what we normally think about in terms of scientific reasoning, because this is very, very different from normal scientific processes. Um, and it took me some time to untangle, you know, so I found it, he talks to us as, as if we know what he's talking about, but of course we don't. And so trying to untangle this segmentation that he's talking about and how, how it's organized is not trivial, it's difficult. Um, so I dug around on the net and I found a text it's from a book called The Oxford Handbook of Process Philosophy and Organization Studies, edited by uh, Jenny Helen Tor Hearns, Daniel Horth, and Robin Holt. And there's a chapter called Bateson, 1904-1980, uh, by Mike uh, Zundel. And I'm just going to read a little section because it's directly relevant, it's very, directly discussing this text. And he says, in comparing the organization of a jellyfish body parts with the organization of a social process of a group of human beings, Bateson operates squarely outside of class-based logics. Such thinking is a bewildering experience at first, resulting in syllogisms of the sort, grass dies, comma, Men die, comma, men are grass. Here, Bateson is after symmetries in temporal patterns across class-based memberships, from earthworms to basalt pillars to tribes and organizations, affording entirely new ways of understanding living relations. Following this spirit, Bateson suggests metaphorical syllogisms of the sort, jellyfish show symmetries, comma, yatmal show symmetries, comma. Thus, there is a pattern that connects both, which could be stated in as if terms, we can understand yatmal as if they were jellyfish. So that's the end of the quote from the handbook, which I thought was it helped me begin to understand what was going on in the chapter in the, in the comparison that he makes. Um, <clears throat> then in Mind and Nature, I went and dug through because I remembered there's a discussion in Mind and Nature about some of these things as well. So I, I dug out a few quotes from Mind and Nature about this. Um, so the anatomy of the crab is repetitive and rhythmical. It is like music, repetitive with modulation. Indeed, the direction from head towards tail corresponds to a sequence in time. In embryology, the head is older than the tail, a 
flow of information as possible from front to rear. Professional biologists talk about phylogenic, phylogenetic homology for that class of facts of which one example is the formal resemblance between my limb bones and those of a horse. Another example is the formal resemblance between the appendages of a crab and those of a lobster. That is one class of facts. Another somehow similar class of facts is what they call serial homology. One example is the rhythmic repetition with change from appendage to appendage down the length of the beast, crab or man. Another, perhaps not quite comparable because of the difference in relation to time, would be the bilateral symmetry of the man or crab. Most of us can remember, okay, and then, uh, so that was a sort of section on, on this issue of segmentation and its relation to, um, to uh, cultural context like Yatmal. And then he goes into, a, he segs into a different discussion, but it's related in, again, in mind and nature. He says, most of us can remember being told, uh, and this is related to the comment I made at the very, very beginning of the first session, based on some things that he said in the film that Nora Bateson did on it. You remember where you talked about the hand and the hand isn't five fingers, it's four relationships between the fingers. Um, and it just keeps coming back and back. It's like, cause this whole chapter has this whole discussion on comparisons and he, he, he proposes that we replace thinking about objects by thinking about relations, right? Uh, so he says, most of us can remember being told that a noun is the name of a person, a place, or a thing. And we can remember the utter boredom of parsing or analyzing sentences. Today, that should be changed. Children could be told that a noun is a word having a certain relationship to a predicate. A verb has a certain relationship to a noun, its subject, and so on. Relationship could be used as basis for definition. And any child could then see that there is something wrong with the sentence, go is a verb. I remember the boredom of analyzing sentences and the boredom later at Cambridge of learning comparative anatomy. Both subjects as taught were torturously unreal. We could have been told something about the pattern which connects, that all communication necessitates context that without context, there is no meaning, and that contexts confer meaning because there is classification of contexts. The teacher could have argued that growth and differentiation must be controlled by communication. The shapes of animals and plants are transforms of messages. Language is itself a form of communication. This echoes what Nora Bateson writes in her Se uh, the second of the two texts we had to read for today. Um, the structure of the input must somehow be reflected as structure of the output. Anatomy must contain an analog of grammar because all anatomy is a transform of message material which must be contextually shaped. And finally, contextual shaping is only another term for grammar. So, um, so this brings together this link between the idea world and the material world, that uh, the ecological world in the material sense that uh, both Bateson is talking about and both Gregory is talking about and Nora is talking about. Um, just to come back on a couple of points that you raised, Johnny. Um, so. Um, I think this idea of liminal is really interesting. And, and um, I, I remember again, but I haven't dug through because it's, I, I need to take the time to, to dig through and find it. But in, in Gregory's mind and nature, there's a whole discussion of thresholds. And thresholds in Gregory Bateson's understanding of things 
um, they're regulators, right? Uh, so the, the discussion is around the nature of a thermostat. Uh, so uh, I think in the, in the clip that uh, I didn't listen to it all the way through, the one between Johnny and Doug in, that you did as a preparation for this, Doug, you were talking about this environment where you had uh, this high heat and this low heat and, you, and, 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 and the two were creating problems for you in the relationship between the two environments. This is exactly what Gregory is talking about when he talks about the role of regulators in this governance situation that, they, that you have uh, a, a threshold that becomes a, um, a regulator in order to maintain a stability. And so there's a relationship between thresholds and regulators, but thresholds are a kind of metaphor, not a, not a metaphor, but they're related to the issue of liminality. And so liminality is a kind of a, of a regulator in this context. Uh, so it, it has a dynamic role within processes to play. Anyway, I think it's another example of this um, loose versus rigorous thinking. I mean, the rigorous thinking is the regulating process stuff, but the loose thing is the liminal idea as a generality. And then putting the two together gives you this relationship between the two. And then a final comment on that, on, uh, on the, so the left brain, right brain, uh, I, I think you mentioned at the end, um, Johnny, that it is, that our understanding of these issues has changed. So, um, left brain, right brain is kind of post Bates and post Gregory, but in today's world, left brain, right brain distinction has also been to some extent criticized. And I'm thinking, I was thinking about it because, because it's left brain, right brain, it may be an example of the fallacy of misplaced concreteness because we think we're talking about concrete things. But in fact, we're talking about groups of ideas when we talk about left brain and right brain. Uh, and the, in that sense, it, it may be dangerous to assume too much reality to that because, because they are groups of ideas. So the sort of modern ideas that uh, while there is a clear distinction to some extent between what goes on from the left brain and the right, goes on from the right brain, each can colonize the other. So there are people who have severe damage to one hemisphere and, and the other does, the other hemisphere takes over the function of the first hemisphere uh, and, and reprograms itself to do pretty well everything that the, the other hemisphere does. So they're not distinct in quite the same way that originally was, was uh, uh, proposed. And, you know, linear thinking is present in the right brain and uh, spatial thinking is present in the left brain, but not in qu quite as much. There's a difference in emphasis, but there's not a difference in processing exactly. So um, yeah, it's, it's a complex issue. So but I think we need to be a little bit careful about it. I use it myself in, 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 in fact, reading Nora Bateson versus Gregory Bateson one gets a sense that in Gregory Bates and his left brain thinking is stronger than his, it's not stronger, it's more present in his discussion than, 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 than the sort of joint thinking, although he's clearly dealing with both kinds of sides of the question. Uh, and Nora is dealing with both sides of the question, but her expression feels very right brain as opposed to Gregory's, which feels very left brain. <laughs> so here I am using the same ideas that I'm saying we need to be careful of. But I, I do think it, it, you know, it is relevant to the discussion to, to talk about that. So, um, so I might I, stop there. I, I, I probably have some more things to say, but I might stop there and let other people uh, chime in. Go ahead, Johnny, if you uh, had something to say. I can pause. Uh, I wanted to respond, but I can make a note of it and come back to that um, because I'm in large agreement 
with I think the um, the puzzlement that you uh, bring forward, Jeffrey. Uh, and I think McGilker's book points to the previous research on left brain, right brain, and debunks it as hugely exaggerated. But he revisits it as a neuroscientist. Um, and um, I think his emphasis was on how the the left brain logic linguistic mind and the right spatial kinesthetic dampen one another and constrain one another. So it isn't like one can do without the other, but he is saying, he, he puts the stress on the right brain as being, uh, having much larger access, much greater spectrum, um, of the, the affective zones and that what some would call the non-conscious. Um, so, but the, the left brain is very addicted to what the cognitive has access to and extremely necessary. If we can't ask questions, we can't learn very much. And that's primarily what the left brain does. So I agree with you. I think there's a, there's that tension. And I think schismogenesis comes out of that tension and we can, talk about in different ways. Certainly poets talk about it in a different way. And I think he focuses, he talks about double vision. Um, he says um, per, uh, a double vision, he's talking about perceptually scanning the interface. We can momentarily sense a clear felt boundary between self and world, and the boundary is good. The momentary experience of acting or reacting upon the boundary is vital to our survival. So um, I'm just adding that as a, a further complexification. But I do think this, this stress that we all feel in these paradoxes and impasses and conflicts, um, they all are different flavors of this fundamental tension. And um, there may not be a resolution. I think that we just muddle on through the best we can. So. Um, anyway, I'm just sharing that with you guys. I think there is a parabrain though. I think uh, I'm drawing on the doors of perception. I think Bates, Bates and quotes Blake quite a bit. And uh, I, I can't remember who was picked up on that, but the, the claim is that the nervous system basically is shutting down information and shuffling it in certain specific ways. Um, and I find that very interesting because once we let go, in meditation and sensory deprivation and certain kinds of chants and you know ryth high, extremely rhythmic kinds of behavior we can um it seems like lift the valve off of the nervous system and we have access to a great deal more than um you know what is allowed basically in, in most of our cultures which want us to constrain ourselves quite a bit so anyway it's a fascinating take on that thank you very much Um, I've just been trying to find a reference which I can't find now, but um, there's a text by uh, Victor Turner um, on liminality and uh, structure and anti-structure, which I haven't read, but um, I've been sent it by someone regarding um, a project we're working on. Um, and it just seems uh, without having read it, I can't really comment. Maybe someone knows more, but it seems like it's really pertinent for what we're talking about. And I, I don't know whether the, the structure and anti-structure, um, maybe it's just a superficial similarity, but I wonder if these relate um, to, the, um, to the loose and strict, um, yeah, loose and strict thinking or not. Um, it's something that I'd like to look into, but um, having not read it, I can't comment. Maybe someone else knows. He's an anthropologist, and, yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I have read him. He's, he's very, um, very much what I think Bateson's all about. He's an anthropologist. He's, he's also a, comes from a theater background. Um, go ahead. Okay. 
I'm reading um, Upside Down Gods by Peter Harry's Jones. And it, it reads, it's an intellectual biography. And what I find um, really kind of remarkable about it is how, how Gregory Bateson has been able to kind of live his abduction, his logic of abduction. And um, like, like Jeffrey mentioned, that uh, form of logic in the syllogisms, um, that I think that comes from Charles Sanders Pierce, um, and it's called abduction. But Gregory seems to be able to move across fields in his work life. That seems pretty remarkable. And like he'll go from... Um, studying uh, schizophrenia in a um, veterans hospital to studying dolphin communication because of the more abstract notion of communication. And I just find that remarkable how he's able to live that form of logic in his work life and how it, how, how it was successful for him. So I just wanted to add that bit of biography. Um, that that's, uh, something that maybe we mentioned or I mentioned in the first session was the, um, which maybe, uh, Ryan, I'm not sure you were there, maybe right at the beginning, um, was, yeah, that Gregory Bateson, as you, as you say, worked in dolphin communication, but with, um, with John Lilly, who was um, obviously like the big, um, uh, the, the most important kind of researcher in those, at those at that time in sensory deprivation and um, particularly uh, research with acid and, um, and sensory deprivation together. So yeah, so that's kind of a, an interesting kind of um, conjunction between those two biographically. I think it's, it's kind of seems really significant, particularly what we're talking about in relation to, yeah, liminality. So yeah. Oh, I was just going to say before, um, which kind of leads in, I guess, um, I'm not quite sure how to sort of bring it into the discussion or whether it's relevant or not, but um, uh, leading on from uh, Johnny's comment in the introduction about um, his dream, um, I was at a lucid dreaming workshop on Friday, um, completely unrelated to this, but um, there's loads of really um, uh, interesting kind of uh, things which I think are really relevant to this, but I just can't quite vocalize how to bring them in at the moment maybe it'll maybe a time will come later in the session or later in another session um where it might be um appropriate to talk about it but um yeah it was just a nice coincidence i think so maybe we'll come up later i definitely would i definitely would encourage you lucy thank you So I, I suppose it's my turn to throw out something that's unrelated that may tie in. Uh, I'm reading Fred Rogers' autobiography, or listening to it. LaVar Burton um, is the reader, which makes it even more enjoyable. Uh, but it, there's a lot I could say about him, but I'm focusing on the structure of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which I had not watched maybe in 20 years uh, 25 years. Uh, this is a, a show that was on in uh, North America, maybe maybe only uh, the States, and geared towards kids, but Fred Rogers was very direct um, and had a, a mission to speak to the child, so he would look directly in the camera. But I, I picked up on how, I, I checked up, also checked out DVDs for my son and um, from the library, so he's been watching uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and the structure of the show is introducing something at the beginning, then jumping into the trolley will come by and go into the, the play world, the imaginary world, and he, he states that directly to the children, so, not, so as not to confuse the two, um, which it's easy as a child to confuse reality for uh, imagination, imagination for reality. So, but what he, he demonstrated in the beginning, if it's introducing a new musical instrument or something, it will appear as like a dreamlike sequence within this imaginal realm. They won't talk directly about the musical instrument, but it will be played by one of the puppets. Uh, they used a lot of puppets in uh, human interaction. But then at the end of the show, he would reincorporate the whole theme remind the children 
directly to the camera that, uh, all right, we're out of the imaginal realm and coming into uh, more concrete reality and kind of essentially saying to kids, what, do we, what have we learned? And that to me is tying in with what we're talking about here with, uh, or what Bateson is talking about and both Nora and Gregory of tying in these two worlds. Uh, that's all I want to say. I, I could riff on that a little bit, Doug. Thank you. Um, I think you mentioning Fred Rogers and that he wanted to um, interact directly with the children. So he looked directly into the camera and, and you mentioned, um, and we, we, we talked about mirrors and windows and uh, see-through mirrors, one, one way and two way and cameras and the technology that we're using and um, the, the nature of the subtle realms, those, the, those liminal zones and those thresholds and those uh, figures. Uh, Victor Turner talks about anti-structure and structure and the, and the figure of the trickster. And the trickster is almost always male. Um, and the, the job of the tricks is to, is to stir up shit, basically. <laughs> you know? And they are, they are uh, little demonic, devilish uh, characters who sometimes are jokers and sometimes are quite mouth, mouthlant. Um, but they, can, um, they are often threshold figures, and they basically keep you the same, unless you can outfox them or outtrick them or, or, um, or fight them wrestled and then you are allowed to go to whatever happens next so i think um these this uh, this idea of uh of structure and anti-structure and um the trickster and what's happening in our world today as we as we do with the media and these these flat screens with these uh talking heads and uh, actually, in our uh, the interview, that uh, the conversation that I had with Doug yesterday, sort of, you know, sort of doing a little rehearsal for today, and for another group we're a part of, um, he he said in our conversation, he said um, the screen disappeared, and it was just you know you you and I in the same kind of psychic space, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, and I think that's probably what Rogers, when he was talking to, the, to, to little children, wanted to happen. He wanted there to be a shared space, meaning-making space, that we could share a reality, a reality together. But I think the, uh, the challenge for us adults, and for children as well, fragile nervous systems that are being indoctrinated in this cultural uh, sort of explosion technology has exploded. Um, I think it's extremely challenging. Uh, breaking down those walls in the theater, they talk about the, you know, there's the, there's a, there's a wall between you and the audience and you see the actors interacting with each other and you have feelings about that interaction. But what happens when the actor turns and addresses the audience directly? Um, I'm, I'm reminded of Barry Jenkins who directed Moonlight. I don't know if any of you have seen Moonlight. And he has a new movie out, um, but he uses this technique very intentionally. So rather than seeing two lovers uh, look into, gaze into one another's eyes, he has the lover turn and look into the camera. So the lover is looking directly at you in the audience. So it has a, a, a strange kind of kinesthetic spatial shift happens because all of a sudden I become the beloved, temporarily, for this character. I feel like I'm entering into that um, liminal zone with the character. But I think great filmmakers like Hitchcock and certainly Barry Jenkins are know how to use this, this medium. So I'm just throwing that out there because I think it's a, a, a fascinating topic. And 
also Ryan mentioned last time about telepresence and non-local effects of this media. And um, I would be very curious if you wanted to, uh, if there's anything else about that, Ryan, that you know you could share because that certainly my research is really going in that direction. I want to learn more and more about how what's happening with our media and our nervous systems and our culture. Thanks. When I think of um, liminal zones, the image that always comes to mind is um, is limbo. Uh, you know, the place between paradise and and hell or heaven and hell uh, and the Gustav Dore illustrations of what goes on in limbo. <laughs> so I think I actually, I actually teach a, a class in one of my things about limbo, uh, because I have a class on, on uh, the limbic system uh, in the brain and and I use one of Gustav Doré's uh, etchings as an introduction to that class because I, so it's a kind of a, a segue, a, a, a transversal segue. Um, the other thing I've, I, I think I've mentioned before when I read Bateson, I, so you talk about mirror, Johnny, um, mirror effects. Well, one of the, perspective effects I have when I read Gregory Bateson is a forward looking and a backward looking perspective because I read Gregory Bateson when I was a young student uh, starting out in a scientific career and now I'm reading Gregory the same text the same text but I'm now a senior researcher at the end of the career looking back on my career and so it's like I have this double vision that's fed through the Batesonian perspective on my own career. And, and when I read um, the, uh, so some of what he talks about, when, you know, I, I can remember reading this material and thinking, wow, this is such an interesting way to do science. But now I look back and, and I can say, well, that was a very interesting way to do science because I followed the Batesonian method for most of my career. So, um, you know, it's what allows me to move astrophysics to forestry to, um, to pattern recognition and, and artificial intelligence, and then on to uh, the arts and, and, uh, and rehabilitation medical fields as well. So, you know, I've, I've done, I, I think of, I consciously throughout much of my career thought of myself as a Batesonian scientist, trying to do similar kinds of things of, of picking patterns from one area and then, apply, and then carrying them forward into another area and applying them out. Uh, I'm probably more right brain than, more right brain in my approach, M more, I'm not, although I have the training to be rig a rigorous thinker the way Bateson sets things out, um, I'm naturally pulled towards the artistic, even though I've been a, you know, I've been a physicist and a, a scientist in, in, in much more mundane sorts of ways over parts of my career. Um, but um, these days I'm very much on a transven transversal kind of uh, modality. So it, it's, 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 I read Bateson and I have these echoes of thinking, well, it would be great to do that. Hey, I did that. Uh, well, it would be great to do this. Hey, well, I did that too. <laughs> it's like this, this schizoid way of reading. <laughs> the sort of the double prison things of what's going on in, in the, you know, so he talks about taking an analogy to extreme and then showing up the, uh, the limits of an analogy. If you push it to extreme, well, I've done that. He talks about this problem of trying to make sense out of uh, his, his, his um, false categories, idos and ethos, and the problems that he had with that. And he talks about breaking them down into a matrix and, and then trying to rethink the concepts as if, 
instead of being separated out into classes, you could treat them as you could move the definition from one class to the other and then see if it still applies and then move it to another class and see if it still applies. And he says, oops, it still applies. So therefore there's a problem with the classification because if you can, if you can make it apply to everything, then it's not really a classification. You see, uh, I've done that too. <laughs> so, I mean, I've, I've fooled myself into those kinds of places as well over the course of my career. So, all of that rings echoes. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was about the, so, I mean, I have to say that I'm thrilled with the Nora Bateson texts. Uh, I feel in a, in a lot of ways she puts into practice what Bateson is sort of teasing out, what Gregory Bateson is teasing out. But when she talks about it, she's mastered it. I mean, there's, it comes through her pores, you know, it's like she starts there and then she takes it forward into places where Gregory was only beginning just to tease out what was possible. And Nora takes us forward in a dramatic way right into the heart of these ideas. Um, and so one of the things that I was noticing, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a Gregory trait because you're because Gregory Bateson is taking patterns from one concept and applying to another, and we're doing that here in the conversation as well. Uh, there's a kind of a feel that you need to hang on to the different ideas and hold them in your in your mind's eye, so that when you're talking about the pattern in one context, you have to sort of glaze out your eyes and think about the same thing in a different context and try and hang on to what you were thinking a moment ago in order to do this transition. Um, so, and then it, and it starts to feel a bit hairy. It starts to feel a bit, uh, it's like, this is not easy to do this. So what am I putting myself through to do this? But then when you get into Nora's text, she talks about, I mean, that's what the mono, um, what you call it? Uh, the monocropping, uh, this idea of of uh, of the opposite of that. So instead of trying to maintain attention to many different areas, you just focus on one and 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 you exclude out everything from the one, which is what she's suggesting. Much of our education tends to do, and I think she's right. Uh, that that the sort of training that we often give people is to exclude out and focus on. So for instance, I work a lot with people in many different disciplines and in each discipline, people have a definition for a term, but it's discipline specific. And so when you work with people in many disciplines, then each of them has their own definition and they often don't agree from one discipline to the other. There's slight differences or in focus or emphasis or or whatever, or sometimes they're even entirely different. So when I do a group discussion with many people from different disciplines, I always bring out the definitions so that everybody, I get everybody to bring out their own uh, uh, discipline specific definition. We put them all up on a board and I, and I say, but we're not going to try and make one definition out of this. We're gonna leave them up and everybody's going to talk and be aware that you have six definitions of the term you're using, not one. You, we don't have to agree on a definition because of course that would be, you know, a huge session on its own just to come up with a single definition that everybody can, can agree on. So I don't do that. I just say we have to leave up these definitions. And when you talk, you're obviously going to talk from your own definition, but you have to be aware of the definitions of the other groups in order to be able to have a shared discussion about these things. So in a way, it's, it's the opposite of the monocropping that Norris Bateson's talking about. And then when she gets into her other, oh, you know, I think in that one, anyway, in, in the other discussion, I think, she says, don't hang on to these things, let them go. <laughs> so that's a lesson for me because, you know, here I am trying to keep everything going 
in this shared space and remember it all and keep aware. And she says, yeah, that's too much effort. You just let it go and allow the connections to be made. We don't have to be in control of the process in the same way, right? Uh, so I also think that's a, a really interesting lesson in, in, in Nora's um, take on, that, on this thing. Stop there, I think. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if I could, uh, I think it would be appropriate to do this exercise because I think it addresses um, the issues that you've just been raising and that many of us are raising. And I think that um, one of the things that Nora said to a group, I was watching her on YouTube talking to a group and also in that liminal leadership um, interview. She was talking about there's meaning making and then there's sense making. And she says, before we can make meaning, we need to know where we are. And she had the big question, where, where are we? Um, I think that's a deep question. And especially when we're talking about structure, any structure and liminal zones and lucid dreams and fiction and drama and symbol and the symbolic i'm just going to offer this as a as an offering it's very simple uh, but it comes out of my observation with uh, with nora and um her question and uh what she was doing with her with the group and so it's take two objects you have a some of you are looking at a laptop. Some of you might have some objects on your desk. Whatever that is. I want you to look at the object. It could be the edge of your computer. But just look at it. And I'm going to ask you to touch it. But before you touch it, I want you to imagine what it will feel like when you, when you touch it. And then go ahead and touch it. So imagine touching it and then touch it. Thank you. For those who, has everyone done that? Okay. Now find another object and do the same thing. Imagine touching it and then touch it. As, and if you just nod your head and let me know that you've done it. Okay, thank you. So I'm just gonna ask, pose a few open-ended questions. You don't have to answer me. I'm just interested in your sensory experience. What is the difference between the two objects? Where is that difference? What happens before the touch? What happens after the touch? What kind of relationship is between the differences? And how old? is that relationship. And does the difference have a size or a shape? And is there anything else about that difference? So there are many more questions I have. And in a system of observer participants, every question we ask 
has an influence on the system. So I, I, I hope these were interesting questions and the field effect. Um, this is something that Nora was very passionate about. The field of the fields. How do we speak from the field? Without a center, it's quite dangerous. If you have a center, you can open to the field and pose questions and the field will respond. So, so thank you very much. I hope this has been a useful exercise and I'd be very curious if anyone um, is making any connections, any, any patterns that connect. Thank you. Thank you, Johnny. That was a lovely exercise. Um, so I guess I will talk about it. Um, so I have this knife. <laughs> it's got this lovely orange handle. It's one of my favorite. It's not a great cutting knife, but it's a knife. Uh, th because of its orange handle, I always know about it. When I look into a drawer, <laughs> That's why I use it a lot. So I it was my first object and it was flatter than I thought it would be when I touched it. <laughs> I guess I was focused on its feel in the hand, in the imagination. And then when I touched it, it was flatter than I thought. So I found that interesting. And then for my second object, so for Christmas, I asked for a, a set of tiny spoons because I love tiny spoons. So I got these tiny spoons for Christmas. Uh, you know, I, I said I, I needed some tiny spoons because it, it, when I go into a restaurant and they give me a tiny spoon to stir my coffee, I walk off with a tiny spoon. And I said, I've got to do, stop doing this. So I asked for, so I got like 20 tiny spoons so I can maybe stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so the tiny spoon was my second object. And I thought, oh, it's going to be flat. But no. <laughs> it was pokey and, and I don't know how to say it, graspable somehow, right? So um, different from what I expected. So uh, again, I, I love this distinction between our conceptualizations, even if, you know, because the conceptualization of the knife and the spoon are conceptualizations that come from my sense ex previous sense experience. But obviously I've abstracted away from those sense experiences in order to come up with a, with a sensation or a, a memory of the object. And they're different from the actual sensory experience, right? So, uh, um, and then of course, spoon and knife have an, other kinds of relationships between them uh, that are belied a little bit by the, the, the touching. So I've been thinking about this thing because you've, this is the, not the first time you've talked about the difference between sense and meaning. Um, I read it, I read it in Deleuze. So it's one of the things that Deleuze talks about is the difference between sense and meaning. Uh, and again, he's more interested in a way in sense than he is in meaning. Um, so it is not a distinction that I'm unfamiliar from other readings, um, but I'm still trying to get a sense <laughs> of what's going on there in this difference and, and why. So I, I, I will look up the Nora interview, I guess you, you said it was, or article, I can't remember. Um, and uh, uh, Doug posted it. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll look yeah, at that I'll, because, I'll uh, uh, repost that. Um, but in in response to the exercise and maybe tying in a few elements that we talked about, what 
was going it through my, my object. One of them was a mechanical pencil here. And I'm not, the questions you asked afterwards, I, I wasn't focused on the relationship between the two objects, nor even the object itself, but kind of the, the moment I experienced between that sense and the sensed imaginal, like what it will feel like and the actual touching reminds me of uh, the yoga nidra exercises I performed maybe six or seven years ago in which at one point in the typical yoga nidra routine, you'll, you'll divide your body, like, uh, focus on the right side or the left side. Um, then there's also sensations. Uh, think, think about hot and cold and also emotions such as anger and love. And then at some point, at least the, the uh, narrator, the one who produced this recording uh, would say, okay, now bring those two together. And the mind, the thinking mind, the rational mind cannot physically, or cannot actually, uh, there's a moment there in which the bringing the two together takes you into that, that, I don't know if it's a liminal realm. Um, somebody mentioned a term earlier, I can't think of. But that, that space in which there's no thinking, maybe the nervous system shuts down. I can't remember, I think it, you were talking about it, Johnny. And, uh, or Nora Bateson talks about going beyond the, the, the thinking there. And tying in the left and right brain, um, there's also the temporal aspect that Jeffrey mentioned of forwards and backwards thinking. Um, I didn't mention another, I can't remember his name, but somebody wrote a book called Top Brain, Bottom Brain, which I think is more along the lines of maybe the evolutionary thinking, style thinking of which we use kind of the, the lizard brain and then it's more of a nested uh, rather than a hierarchical uh, type of thinking. But if we put all that, that brain work together and, and think maybe what are we thinking at this moment or introduce something else, then there's, there's some spot within that perhaps could be described as the mind that, that can't focus on the various dimensions of the mind. Uh, so that's all I want to say there. Um, <clears throat> this exercise, it kind of pointed to me about, um, pointed to a lead, uh, exercise in leadership in the Anthropocene, I think, because all those liminal experiences that we had in, in, in judging and comparing, um, what we imagined and what we sensed and all those questions of relationship afterwards really kind of grounded, uh, myself. And I think perhaps the group in an orientation, in a location, um, in, in kind of, uh, you know, in, in tying, tying things together through those liminal spaces and the, the luminous kind of the blissful um, realization of pattern through those interconnections. And that really, really tries to, um, really attempts to um, ground an identity, I think, in kind of these, in this flux and in these fragmented and dissociative times we're in. I think that grounding and that coming together of all those liminal spaces in that pattern and in the body. And I think the body and the nervous system have a role in the telepresence. I think we're, we're kind of, you know, we can be compared to one mind, but also um, that mind is also like a body, I think. Um, so I think it really, it's, it grounds us and that enables us to um, know where we are at this moment in the Anthropocene and and that leads to more creative action, I think. So that's how I see it as a exercise in leadership. Um, so the two um, things that I chose, I can't really show you because they're kind of part of what the laptop's on, so they're fixed at different parts of the kind of 
uh, stool chair thing that um, I'm balancing my laptop on. But the back of it is made of, um, has got this kind of dyed, um, I think it's uh, like sheep. It's like real sheep, like wool. Anyway, so there's that. So that was my first one. And then the other one was the edge of the chair, which is this kind of, it's made of um, uh, this really nice um, finished wood that's had woodworm in it, which has been treated. There's no woodworm in it now, but it's had woodworm in it. So it's full of woodworm holes. And then the edge of it is cut in this uh, kind of very distinct pattern. So the second object was just running my finger on the edge of this very precise pattern. So these things are two uh, very radically, experientially very different. Um, so when you, um, Johnny, when you said, um, what does the difference between these two things, um, uh, how big is it or what is it, what are the qualities of it? Uh, the only way that I could sort of consider this is to consider them both on the same plane was by kind of reducing them both to data and envisaging the way that um, that the wool, for example, would kind of appear in only the places where it touched my surface of my skin. So it's like reading, um, it's like scanning something rather than I kind of lost my body in that experience. It was kind of uh, very strange just imagining. So running my finger on the edge of the wood, it became just like a single line. And, and whereas the wool itself was this kind of pattern that I could kind of see in my mind's eye on my hand. Um, so it, yeah, it was just reducing it to like a, like a diagram of a, of a sensory experience or something, which is, um, yeah, which was just something that seemed like the only way of doing that. But that, maybe that's me just having no imagination. <laughs> I don't know. But it was a really interesting experience to try. So, um, uh, yeah, so thank you for that. I enjoyed that. Uh, well, thank you very much. You've given me uh, a lot of information. And fortunately, we have this technology. So this is all recorded. So I can, at my leisure, review the recording. And each of us, I use the theater metaphor quite a bit. We're performers. Um, you, you get a set of instructions. You try to make sense of them. You rehearse them. Then you go out there and you try to perform, right? And what I loved about all of your descriptions were very different. I would say idiosyncratic, probably quite unique. Um, there probably no one else on the planet who's going to come up with this, with what you came up with. Yet it's understandable, and that I think is what's very intriguing about we are a part of and apart from one another, and that felt sense of that boundary is crucial for our survival, according to Bateson, and I believe Nora would agree. Um, and these liminal zones. And you talk about yoga nidra, Doug. I've been practicing yoga nidra for 30 years. And you mentioned the, and I'm sure many of us have done different kinds of meditation practices, trance work, sensory deprivation. You mentioned the imaginal, Doug. And I thought that was so interesting because there's a big difference between the imaginal and the imaginary. And I believe our culture is extremely deficient because we reduce the imaginal realm to the, oh, she just has a vivid imagination. <laughs> and I think uh, we, we, and I think this is what, uh, Bateson was grappling with epistemology and our theories of knowledge. And we all have an epistemology. You probably didn't realize that when you woke up and had breakfast today that you have an epistemology, but he says we all have one. If you say you don't have one, you probably have a really bad one. So we need to be updating our epistemologies. 
And I think this is what we're doing in this little exercise, is how do we know? Uh, how do we know what we know? And the relationship to the body. And, and the imaginary and the imaginal. The imaginal is not subjective, purely subjective. There are some who, who are claiming, and I'm one of them, that the imaginal has an objective component to it. It's not arbitrary. Like as I had that liminal experience, I heard a voice and it was above my head and the voice above my head oriented me in space. I knew what was up, down, left, right. This is sort of the vestibular system in the inner ear. This is the first system that comes online in the embryo. The cell does not know how to differentiate until it knows what's up, down, left, right. Then the cells know where to go. So I think this is real primary stuff. And that's why I think it's very old, very ancient, what we're doing here. And also I have to say, when you said uh, you were reach, reaching out for the, the, the knife and the spoon, and you, I think you, uh, you said that it was flatter. I misheard you. And I thought you said this, the knife was flattered that you touched it. <laughs> 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 and I went, well, okay. <laughs> That's totally unexpected. But I had anyway. that as well. <laughs> oh, okay. So I think I think this is a, an interesting thing too about the the paradox, the ambiguity, the you know how we always and what's intended and what's unintended. I think that makes for uh, all kinds of communiques from the field that are infinitely rich and very funny sometimes. As well as sometimes very nightmarish. So, uh, Nora's teaching well, us about uh, how to think about objects as part of the mind, right? I mean, this is obviously Gregory's argument as well, but Nora takes us much further into that argument. Um, I had a, a really interesting discussion yesterday with a young scientist um, that I'm, who, who I'm involved in mentoring to get to the next level in her career. And, and she's a scientist who who um, studies freshwater um, environments, ecologies. Um, and uh, she was telling me about, uh, she has an interest in, in um, human-made uh, freshwater ecologies. Um, so she was, because she, she says it's, it, it, oddly, it's not studied much. Most ecologies look at natural, ecologies and they don't look at human artificial ecologies but in freshwater there are huge areas of the world where where um, these freshwater ecologies have been artificially created uh, and she was giving examples like um you know obviously she, like she was talking about fields uh in south america which have where they've erased the they've taken down the forest and they've planted fields um but she says the fields, there are new rivers that are forming in these flat field lands in these areas that didn't exist before because the soil properties have totally changed. And as a result, these new rivers are forming, you know, so they're artificially man, human made, but, but they're not intentionally made. They're accidents that came out of these reorganizations of the landscape. Uh, and she also talked about, um, um, uh, Laos, the, the country, because it was so heavily bombed that you have uh, thousands and thousands of bomb craters, and these have filled up with water. And now they're being used by the people who live there in all sorts of creative and unusual ways, you know, whatever. To, you know, I, I had mentioned to her pizzy culture, so some of them are used for that way. and they're used in all sorts of different ways. So again, these are artificially made, but not necessarily intentionally made, right? So this is the kind of, uh, of uh, thing that she's looking at. And um, when I was, and she was, so she's talking about, and, and I was sort of saying, I was thinking about it, or she was telling me about it, and I was thinking, oh yeah, so like, if I'm adopting a, a Batesonian perspective on this, then one of the questions that comes to came to me, which I asked her, was, how does how do these uh, artificially created waterways change how we understand ourselves as humans? 
right? So that's a, that's a Batesonian question uh, and an interesting one. So, um, and that is teased that Nora Bates' discussion in the latter part of the second text uh, addresses. So this idea of, of what is an ecology of mind, what does that say about mind? And then, and then flipping the question, what is a mind of ecology and what does that say about ecology, right? So this sort of dual question about these two and it's related to this discussion I had. Um, and I, I also found that the thing, the text in, so she says uh, about this issue of holding the different parts in mind. She says, a lightness in the way we hold thoughts gives us room to learn, to shift perspective, and to keep a rigorous humility of confusion. So this is the, this is the thing. Don't hang on. Keep your presence for these multitudinal ideas light, right? And she also says, most ideas live in the body's reading of its environment. So this comes back to the exercise that you had us do, Johnny. Uh, it's the way we, in, we tend, I think we tend to fall into the trap of conceptualizing our environments in conceptual terms, rather than the body itself reads the environment. And if we were more attentive to the way the body reads the environment, rather than imposing these external conceptualizations on it, I think we'd be, we'd be living more fully the sort of interplay between ecology and mind that the two of them are talking about. Um, and then at the very end, she says, which I loved and I have to think about, uh, the mind and the brain are not the same thing. One is in the head and the other is spread everywhere. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lesson there. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I really liked that bit, um, that statement by, by Nora, um, that the idea that the mind is spread everywhere because at first um, I initially took it to be that it's um, that it's not just you know it's not just in your it's not just in your brain or in your head it's kind of distributed throughout your body but then of course I realized that what she probably means is that it's um, it's interpersonal and it's interspecies and it's you know it's like a universal consciousness rather than a um rather than a, like a sovereign mind inside a like in captured with inside a um a physical body so i thought it was a really nice um way of describing that but without maybe the baggage of the kind of new age psychedelic language of universal collective consciousness which is um is can get in the way sometimes when trying to talk about um these things in relation to ecology and um which is something i brought up before actually which was about um uh about ecology in relation to psychedelic experience um so yeah, I thought, I mean, this is how I interpreted what Nora was talking about anyway, but I thought it was a really um, great analogy. So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. I, I just want to say something very briefly because I know we're almost running out of time, uh, but I think Bateson, um, uh, he talks, Angels Fear to Tread, I think is one of his last books. Um, but he talks a lot about for him, there were a lot of areas that were fearful, especially coming from an academic background. You would be censored. Uh, and I think you would still be censored in most academic backgrounds. But, but uh, I think Nora, I think, isn't an academic. She makes that really clear. She doesn't work in academia. She has no institutional support. And there are no rules she can break. She can do whatever she wants. Um, but there's risks. But I think that's fascinating because you can, I can, I can tell she, she's very loose in a way I don't think her father was. 
he was very cautious. But I think he was a maverick, even though he worked within the constraints of a system which, uh, you know, would shoot, shoot him down quite a bit if he didn't follow a certain way of thinking. So I think that's his, his great uh, generative creative capacity. But I think what he, he was fearful of was the whole, uh, um, the whole idea of God. And um, uh, he talks about pathology, which academia likes to talk about a lot. And he says, we can talk about pathology, about how something is broken, because that's easy. When everything is working well, that's very hard to talk about. Um, and, and most of the time, things are working well. And he says, if you want to talk about that, you have to go into the sacred. And that is for a lot of, you know, a lot of academics from his generation, uh, a taboo. Ours from, too. Ours too. Ours too. Oh, you would know because you're, you're an academic. <laughs> so I think this is our ongoing uh, challenge as we're Janus faced. I think Janus, Janus faced uh, is you're looking to the past and the future at the same time. We're also looking inside and outside at the same time. So we're Janus faced creatures. And I think this is an is enormous challenge. And um, I'm really grateful we've had this opportunity to create this forum together so that we can go to the edge and go within and go beyond perhaps, so that we can discover that we're not here just to suffer. There is suffering, but that's not what we're here for. There's a lot of joy and pleasure and aesthetic enjoyment as well. Thank you. So I guess in response to the, the mind and the brain, um, it reminds me of, I don't know who first said it, but it, this was Nicholas of Cusa, or Cusa, but he says, God is an infinite circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And during our Slaughter Dyke reading, um, which kind of plays on this theme um, as a lead up to the God is dead and all sorts of the, the deflating of the monosphere, I, I think is what Slaughter Dyke terms it as. But I, when playing with that metaphor, um, as Nora, she, I'll read it again. So the mind and the brain are not the same thing. One is in the head and the other is spread everywhere. So I take that as the brain is the individual, as we noted in the exercise and uh, Ryan kind of clarified with uh, better phrasing for, for the group or for everyone um, that there is this, this kind of one mind, um, which we can, it's not contained within this circumference here. Um, so we, we pick up on that, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, it's been called God or after um, that guy died. Uh, it has multiple names nowadays, but... Um, so it's, it's nowhere, and we're demonstrating that right now, that we, we can be our one, mo or one brain, but right now in this conversation and what happens typically in these conversations, that we reach some formation of one mind, which, of course, it doesn't have a circumference. We're all around the globe sharing these conversations on a, a flat screen. <laughs> well, um, I love this um, connection with the sacred, of course. Um, my second, second, my second 20 year plan is to integrate the sacred into the sciences, uh, which I'm about six years into. <laughs> so again, a post Batesonian exercise. Um, um, what was I going to say about that? Hmm.
I've got a blank. Uh, I'll uh, I'll shut up and and uh, maybe it'll come back to me. Do we do we usually go to noon or twelve thirty? What is our time frame? We usually go to twelve thirty. But okay, great. So we have plenty of time. Yeah, I think we have a bit more time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm glad. So we can be leisurely. Mm. I, I want to uh, ask Lucy if this would be an appropriate time. I would love to hear about your lucid dreaming workshop and if there might be any connections, if you're up for that. Um, yeah, I was just thinking um, when Doug mentioned, um, uh, he just said that, you know, we're all experiencing this through this sort of flat screen. And it goes back to something that came up earlier maybe that you mentioned Johnny that um uh in relation to telepresence I can't remember exactly what you said but um there was something that there was, a, there was a, something that someone said in this workshop that it was like a five hour evening workshop um uh about the theory and practice of lucid dreaming and um someone said we were talking about our experiences um and someone said that uh, we were talking about continuity in dreams so um we're talking about recurring dreams and um the things you can learn from recurring dreams and then what happens when you learn what uh, when you when you have learnt what a recurring dream is trying to tell you and then usually the result of that is that you stop having it so it's kind of this lesson which um, once it once it's deemed to be effective, it it finishes. But anyway, he was saying that um, uh, another aspect of you know continuity and and recurring dreams is that you um, if you wake up from a dream, can you then lie back down again and re-enter the same narrative? And he was saying which is something that I think maybe we've all had a bit of experience of, you know, of, of starting a dream again or whatever. But he was saying that um, whenever he does that, um, uh, the, the shift in, like, in perspective in the dream, it gets removed by one. So he'll be, he always dreams in the first person. So like, um, you know, so he's not looking at himself. So he's looking out of his own eyes. And then if he goes to, if he, sorry, if he wakes up and then re-enters the dream again, it's exactly the same, but he's looking at himself from a remove. Um, and, and then the dream carries on as normal. And then if he wakes up again and goes through the process again, he'll then be kind of looking at it from above. So it's this kind of continuous um, uh, kind of process of abstraction from uh, or like that comes as a result of a, a self consciousness or an awareness of the um, of the structure of of a dreamscape or a dream experience. So um, I wasn't sure exactly how that fitted in with the conversation, but it seemed um, it seemed to fit somewhere in the discussion about telepresence. Um, and yeah, Johnny, you mentioned about, um, so I, I don't know what your words were, but you said that you were talking about digital kind of mediation. Um, and this seems uh, like a comment, this thing from the workshop seemed like a comment on, yeah, like the, the abstraction of liminal experience or something. I can't quite put it into words, but, um, it's just been something I've been thinking about in the back of my mind while we've been talking. Um, because it was, yeah, there was so many, it was a really great experience, this workshop. And um, I've come away with it, from it, with all these sort of um, ideas and plans of what I'm going to do with it. So um, I don't know if that comment is any use, is any use to the discussion, but <laughs> I thought it might be interesting. Thank you. I think that's very useful. And I, uh, I borrowed telepresence from Ryan. Ryan mentioned it last time. 
Um, and so I'm very uh, interested. And I think you'd mentioned, Ryan, that there's telepresence and there are local effects that are occurring in our communiques here. So we're, we're, we may be in different parts of the globe, but we learn something from one another and we go out into the street and we, and we can bring that learning with us. And I think that is, can be extremely positive uh, or it can be detrimental because if we go out into the street and we bring an expanded awareness of visionary capacity, we will be enlivening all of our contacts probably or we might be overly sensitive and not be able to function well at all. I've had both of those experiences. Um, sometimes I'm just overloaded. Uh, I'll go out into the street and have a temper tantrum with somebody <laughs> you know, because they'll trigger me in ways and my post-traumatic stress syndrome starts to come up. And I think this is uh, the challenge for our, our sensitive people in this uh, an Anthropocene. And I think this is something that uh, has been noted by Nora uh, sensitivity is in these liminal zones uh, can enhance our discomfort and uh, and sometimes I can't remember exactly what you said but there's um oh our, our culture our culture is dedicated to numbing itself we have uh, our addictions, our, narc our narcotics, our shopping fr fr frenzies, um, you know, our, our habitual um, need to maintain our comfort zones and protect our turf. Um, this kind of uh, need to numb. And I think our, I, I think our, uh, our medical, uh, education, you know, psychology. I mean, if you look at all the disciplines and how the pharmaceuticals, how much money is pumped into pathologizing, getting the label, the pathological label in place, putting in the diagnostic statistical manual, and then uh, giving them a drug. And I think this is a, a product, perhaps, of this, uh, this, this, this phase that we're in, the, this uh, intense mental structure, which, which is trying to hold itself together uh, using these kind of neoliberal uh, philosophy where everything is competitive and dog eat dog and the winner takes all, which, you know, it's, it's uh, having devastating effects on our, uh, not just our, our psychological lives and our relationships with one another, but our, uh, the environment is, um, you know, we, we're having to look at these, uh, what, what's happening very dramatically, very quickly. So she says we're already, the future that we were fearing for so long, certainly Bateson was one of the, definitely, he was prophesying, he was a prophet in many ways. That future's here. We're in the first stages of the Anthropocene. The worst things we could be afraid of are happening right now. And uh, I'm like everybody else. It's like, well, how can I get out of this funk, you know? And um, and I go. Sh I, my thing is going to bookstores, used bookstores, and buying lots of books. <laughs> you may notice books that I'll never get a chance to read in a lifetime. But I've still. But that's my form of bibliophilia. It's probably a, a healthier addiction than than uh, using cocaine or something else. But I think. Uh, you know, we all have to find our ways of coping. And she's very sensitive. As a sensitive person, she says, yeah, how much of this can we take? You know, what's coming at us? Um, and I think this is the challenge. And I hope I'm very grateful for this forum because I think we can, you know, this isn't something you're going to get on CNN or Fox News, you know, or our media is totally binar binaries uh, with what, two positions, like the Republicans and the Democrats. And the, their differences are very small. They're both nihilists to the core. One's more active nihilist and one's more passive nihilist, but they're both basically just telling you life signifies nothing except for your bank account. <clears throat> and I think we're in that uh, dilemma. Uh, who's going to change it? You know, look at Parliament and the Brexit, look at 
what's happening in Catalonia, looking what's happening at Quebec, you know, looking what's happening in the U.S. Congress. Um, how does micro and macro um, come together? Um, this is, I don't think any of us have any answers for it. I don't think Nora does. Nora doesn't claim to, but she is writing, I think, uh, that sensory acuity. How do we make how do we make meaning if we're not making any sense? And that metaphor of the frog heating up in the, the, the water is slowly heating up, but it's happening so gradually that the frog doesn't realize it until it's boiled to death. And that's a, a very deep metaphor, I think, for our condition right now. So I remembered what I was gonna say, listening to you, Johnny, when you talked about pathology. Um, it's the, so I mean ecology in a way is what you're talking about when you say a system which works right so uh, an ecology whether it's a natural ecology or, an, or a human made ecology in the way that I described a uh, short sh 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 while ago are um, is a system that isn't broken right so and ecology is hard to study just like pathologies are easier to study, right? So um, I think that's uh, exactly right. Uh, and the connection to the spiritual is there as well because uh, the, the sacred and the spiritual are also systems that work uh, and not, and are not, or they can be pathological, I suppose. I mean, uh, uh, one would presume that the kind of, uh, spiritual ecology that was present in the ISIS eruption was uh, pathological. Uh, but um, in general, I think one's looking at a healthy, uh, or a certain level of health in, in going on in, in, in uh, spiritual communities. So it's kind of an interesting uh, segue or link into these things. Um, Pathologies and uh, I'm losing it again. <laughs> um, well, at least you know you're losing it. <laughs> you know you're losing it. You don't have to worry about Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is when people don't remember that they've lost it. You know, there's a yeah. very important because I, I lose it all the time, but I remember that I lost it. Uh, so that, the, the other thing I was going to say was about dreams. So I've I've always been fascinated with dreams, I suppose, like many people. Um, I've long felt that there's a, people think of dreams as being chaotic, you know, that lots of different things happen and, and they don't feel very stable. But I've always felt there's a logic to dreams. It's just a different logic from the one that we have in our everyday lives. And in our everyday lives, it's the environment that is more or less stable. I mean, it, it moves and it changes because we walk through it and because things are going on in it. But in general, it's stable. And it's our emotional states that shift in response to what's going on in the environment. But I think in the dream world, it's the other way around. It's our emotional states that are stable. And it's the environment that shifts to respond to those emotional states. And so that's the sort of, it's kind of an inverted logic as opposed to a, it is a different logic, but it's also an inverted logic. Um, and, and it's part of why dreams are so fascinating because they allow us to explore our own internal emotional states through a kind of interaction with, this, with these generated environments rather than opposed to, to um, so anyway, there's something interesting there. But I had uh, a question to you, the two of you who are active in the lucid dreaming context, because it comes back to this uh, thing that um, uh, Nora is talking about. Uh, most ideas live in the body's reading of its environment and that, um, that our interaction with the everyday world is very much through our body. Uh, but it seems to me that in dream states, we're often not as aware of our body. B body doesn't seem to be involved in the same way. And I'm wondering whether lucid dreaming has something to do with a certain level of awareness of the body within the dream in a way that 
dreaming usually doesn't. I, I, it's just a kind of question that I have. Well, I think there is, um, well, for me, the body, this is my current metaphor, the body is, is a lucid dream. Um, when I, because I've been probably overdoing it with the uh, yoga nidra, I probably got so fascinated by the effects um, and the and the different kinds of loops that you get into. Uh, it it can become a, a cosmic theater, and I had, and you can study. It's a body. The subtle body is a different kind of body than the physical body. Um, gravity is not optional in the physical. In the subtle, it is. You can fly, but you don't. But you can also walk down the street, and you can make a decision about that, um, which is not an option here in this uh, physical experience. I also have. A, a, I remember having a very a series of really interesting experiments that I conducted on myself. I remember I was lying down in my bed, taking an afternoon nap. I just had a big fight with somebody. So I was very agitated. So I had to really chill out and relax so I could have this little nap. And I didn't expect it, but all of a sudden, I was lying in bed, my eyes closed, starting, I could hear myself start to snore. And then I was, I noticed that I was walking down a path and I could hear gravel the crunch of gravel, and I felt the sensations of feet. And I looked around and there was a sky and there were trees. And then I realized I didn't have a body, but I had the sensations and I had the sounds and I had the sights as if there was a body. But having posed, opened up to that, I looked around and I, oh, okay, I can, I can see and feel my feet. I look for hands. If you've read Castaneda, he says, when you're in a dream, look for your hand. Because if you can find your hand, you'll start to be aware of, of, a, of a, you're in a, a synesthesia landscape. Um, very different from the one in the physical, but related. But I remember I was walking down the, the path and I saw a house. And I remember walking towards the house, but I noticed there was a pond. And I thought, wow, I wonder what water feels like in the subtle realm. So I reached my hand into the water and I moved it around and I felt sensations, not like the physical. It was sort of similar, but not the same. I walked into the house and I said, hello, is anyone here? No one was there. I opened up a cabinet. I pulled out a glass and I was curious, what will happen since you know gravity is optional? I know I could fly, but I didn't want to. I wanted to explore this. What would happen if I dropped the glass? And I did, and it hit the floor and the glass shattered. But the sound of the glass shattering and the sight of the glass shattering were not in sync. So it hit, shattered, and then I heard the crack of the glass. So I thought, oh, that's curious. So this, the sound and the, the visual and the auditory are not in sync. So there's a gap there, but there's an identity that was able to hold that gappiness. So I, I'm just offering this as an opportunity for thinking, contemplating this and what it all means, I'm not sure, but I think we're, I think we're much more, as uh, Nora says, than one plus one equals two. <laughs> I think there's no algorithms for this. And that's why I think when people are talking about the the, the virtual realities, um, putting on these Google glasses and whatever. I thought, man, is that primitive compared to what we can do and, and to what the Tibetans have been doing for many, many centuries. They've been exploring these subtle realms. And what is the relationship between the subtle and the physical? I believe there's a very deep one. Um, and I, I am using my time, this precious sacred experience, of this physical body to learn about that that felt sense between the subtle and the physical and to, quite frankly this this digital stuff has really fucked me up i uh, i think sensitive persons are prone to uh you know are, are sometimes sensitive to the toxic 
And I think that uh, I'm seeing a lot of, uh, you know, alarming behaviors happening between people that I don't think is, it's probably produced by the, the, the overuse of this technology or that, or that just the technology itself, it has toxic dimension to it. And that's the shadow side of it. And can we be alert to this shadow side of this, of this technology? And can we uh, find antidotes perhaps to the stresses that it creates? And can we um, use it in a way that's creative uh, rather than pathological? I think that's a, an open question for me. But thank you for this opportunity to explore these very sort of very esoteric kind of ideas. And I think I, I've gone to spiritual teachers and they basically tell, tell me, they say, you're on your own. <laughs> you know? Nobody really, there's no manual for this. <laughs> I've gone to very, uh, really deep teachers, especially in the Buddhist tradition who just basically say, wish, wish me luck. Um, but I think there is a, a lot of practitioners out there that are pooling their resources now and they're experimenting, I think, at very high levels. And um, I think this is getting into our, into our culture, this, uh, these, these capacities, the telepathic, the lucid dreaming, the near-death experience, um, out-of-body experience, what it is to have a body. Uh, and I think the the really diminished view most people have of what the body is. And, um, you know, in our neoliberal culture, which is so narcissistic and nihilistic, I think really shuts down and makes premature cognitive commitments about what the body is. So I hope we can, in this forum, just open that, open up our doubts, you know, and our doubts can be really creative, I think. But it depends on what we're doubting, of course. Thank you. So I'm looking for last minute comments as we're coming up to the 90 minute mark. Also, did anybody think about um, leading the next uh, next week's session? Yeah, I, I'll have to say no, but um, I, based on my schedule, the end of the month with work uh, tends to be busy, but uh, two weeks from now, I don't mind doing that. Good. Yeah, similarly, I'm away um, for five days from tomorrow, so I, I can't commit to doing next week, but I'm very happy to do one in the future, certainly. I look forward to doing that. Um, I guess I can volunteer to do next week's. Um, I'll give it my best shot. That would be super, Ryan. Yeah. But in in sense of just last closing comments, I think one way to frame what we've been saying is Jung's uh, psychological types between sense and intuition, the physical body and the subtle body, the the body and the physical body and the imagination or dreams, intuition, psi, telepresence. And I think there's this necessary complementary relationship between the two that we've been trying to elucidate. I think that. Um, we can intuit whole patterns in the sense of futurity, but if we're not ready to move um, concretely within those in-between spaces, then, um, then it's just an abstraction. We need to, and I think that's what Nora Bateson gives us. She gives us kind of this, this methodology to move in those in-between spaces, move in this new terrain um, in, in the flux that, that in the, in, in this kind of chaos that we're in, I guess. Um, I think she really kind of is a guide and she's not giving us any answers, but she's giving us kind of a, uh, a method or a technique or a, a logic, even an embodied logic or how to move within these times. And I think that's very precious. Beautifully said. Yeah. Great. So we have our, Work cut out for us. Um, one of the things I've noticed is that even though these are individual texts and can be read alone, there is an argument building here. Um, and it's one of the interesting things. There's an argument, Gregory Bateson is building an argument, Nora Bateson is building an argument, somewhat different from Gregory's. And we are having our own argument that, that is developing here too. Which is, so I think it's very interesting the way this is, is, uh, is developing. I don't have a specific closing um, 
statement other than I want to thank you for the pace that you're setting this at. Um, very slow reading. Um, typically I'm one to, oh, I've got the, the two books and I will go all the way through and do that. I'm taking it uh, as assigned. And it's, it's a mystery to me where this will lead. Uh, there's quite a bit left. It seems like we've discussed everything <laughs> all around. Um, maybe we're, we're, we, we've gone all over the place. And, but the ideas being presented by the authors, as well as what we're discussing here, um, it's really quite promising for this time frame that you've set for. So just a quick appreciation for this setup. Thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> Looking forward to the weeks that follow. Yeah, thank you. That is very intentional, right? So um, the, to do this very slow because Basin is deep. I mean, Slaughter Dyke is fun and interesting and has, but, but not deep in the same way that Basin is. Uh, um, so, uh, you know, Slaughter Dyke, we took fairly large chunks of text to, to read and respond to. And we could do that with Bateson, but we would miss 90% of what he's saying if we did that, I think. So. I, I love also that you're, 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 we have two authors. So yeah. there's a double description embedded in this, what we're doing here. I think there's a, an invitation to an ecological practice. This is front and center in what, what Bateson was doing, having a double description. You cover up one eye, you see something. You cover up the other eye, you see something. You have two eyes, you get depth. And I think that's what he was most drawn to is that depth dimension. And we could have brought Mary Catherine Bateson into it too, but uh, I think it's probably a good thing to limit it to some extent. Uh, I do like Mary Catherine Bateson's writing as well. But uh... well, I guess one more comment about the Cosmos Cafe the topic's very week to week, but there are a few upcoming topics that seem to be tied in quite a bit with what we're discussing here. So that is on Tuesdays, if you're available or willing, or just want to watch the recording, um, you can check out the Infinite Conversation site. Um, but that is Eastern time, that's from two to four. Um, so uh, just a Quick invitation there. We'll be discussing, uh, Johnny will lead uh, the we, prelude to William Connolly's Facing the Planetary, which... Yeah, we're just doing the first the first uh, chapter, I think. But it's very much related, I think, to this, uh, what we're doing here. Thanks. Any final comments, Lucy? Um, no, nothing specific, just thank you. Yes, I'm really appreciating the, um, the, yeah, the pace, the kind of, um, close reading of short amounts. Um, and I think the weekly format is also really great because it kind of, um, it really helps with the, um, the kind of flow of the conversation. And yeah, I think, yes, thank you for organizing and for everyone else for their, um, for their comments and, input it's been really good okay so let's uh so we we'll look forward to next week um i'll tentatively schedule you doug to do next week not next week but the week afters uh, uh uh reading and possibly lucy if you're available the week following from that and then we'll we'll figure it out again after we is that just as a rough plan just so that we know where we're at these things and and where you're at too so that you can prepare for it uh Obviously, as you can see, Johnny does his introduction very differently than I did. So you don't have to follow a particular style. You just figure out what works for you and, and, and we'll love it anyway. So. <laughs> so have a good week, everybody, and see you all next time.